Before we begin today's video, I'd just like to announce that I'm going to be a guest at Doki Doki in Manchester, UK this August. I'll be hosting a live panel on the films of Hayao Miyazaki, as I go into a deep dive into the themes and ideas behind these films. So if you'd like to come meet me in person, then this is your chance. Now, on to the video. Howdy folks, Jamboreeki here, and welcome to another episode of Jamboreeki Orange, the show where my patrons decide what I review. The options for this episode included Chippendale Rescue Rangers, Top Gun, The Batman, Bell, Star Wars A New Hope, and Good Burger. They chose Star Wars A New Hope. In a galaxy far, far, far away, the evil Darth Vader plans to rule the universe under a cruel empire, using a planet-destroying space station called the Death Star. Rebel Princess Leia has stored the Death Star's plans and an SOS message in a droid called R2-D2 for Obi-Wan Kenobi. When R2-D2 and his partner C-3PO end upon the desert planet of Tatooine, they're purchased by a farmer called Owen. Owen's nephew, Luke Skywalker, discovers the princess has helped Obi-Wan on R2-D2's system. Luckily, Luke finds Obi-Wan hiding out out as a hermit. Obi-Wan explains that he not only trained Luke's father to be a Jedi, but that Luke's dad was killed by Darth Vader. Kenobi convinces Luke to take up Jedi training and join him on this quest to save the princess. Luke and Obi-Wan hire mercenary Han Solo and his partner Chewbacca, who both own the powerful spacecraft the Millennium Falcon. Our heroes rescue the princess, but now they have to escape without being caught and use the Death Star plans to defeat Darth Vader. It's kind of a miracle that this film became the huge hit we know today. You see, it had the world against it. Fox didn't believe in it, the actors didn't understand the script, and the budget was quite low for Hollywood standards. Yet, despite everyone's lack of faith and its many disadvantages, A New Hope wasn't just a blockbuster smash, it was a pop culture groundbreaker that redefined cinema. We now see Star Wars as this sci-fi cash cow juggernaut, but the first film in the series didn't have the support the franchise has today. Heck, the production of the film was such a demanding ball of stress for director George Lucas that he ended up in hospital at one point. On the surface, A New Hope is a fairly standard space adventure story, but this was completely intentional. George actually studied and researched classic myths to nail down every trope that appears in folklore. It's why the film feels so timeless. It's taking inspiration from tales that have been passed on for generations. The film isn't just tracing these old-fashioned cliches, though. George put a lot of himself into the script. The end result is a film that adopts the classical myth template, but layers it with complex world-building, a wide array of alien races, Buddhist-influenced spirituality, and original futuristic technology. Not to mention, George took inspiration from his favourite TV and media, from the samurai films of Akira Kurosawa to the campy Flash Gordon serials of his childhood. All these little details are what give flavour and texture to Star Wars, and make it more than just a by-the-numbers space adventure. During the 70s, US cinema was gritty, serious, pessimistic and dystopian, plus the American climate was very bleak, due to the horrors of the Vietnam War and Nixon's portrayal. Then in comes George Lucas with a new hope, to bring a ray of light to audiences' screens, a film that acknowledges that evil is trying to gain power, and people are continuing to suffer, but also gives optimism to audiences through a new generation of heroes. Luke himself is very much your archetypal movie hero, a humble dreamer who wishes for a more exciting life. It just isn't fair. Oh, Biggs is right. I'm never gonna get out of here. Is there anything I might do to help? Oh, not unless you can alter time, speed up the harvest, or teleport me off this rock. And Obi-Wan grants him that wish. It's how he embraces his new destiny that makes him a compelling character to watch. There's an endearing charm to how he puts a sincere amount of faith in Obi-Wan. This is his dad's mentor, and maybe the closest he'll ever get to being with the dad he never met. So, it's kind of moving watching him bond with Obi-Wan over training and spirituality. <laughs> Remember, a Jedi can feel the Force flowing through him. You mean he controls your actions? Partially, but it also obeys your commands. We become engaged in his story because we want to know if this farm boy can be the hero he's always wanted, or should he just go back home? Like, I think this is why fans resonate with him. He's your average working class Joe who has been thrusted into the role of a hero, and gets a chance to prove that a desert kid can do great things. However, while this is very much Luke's story, a big appeal of the film is the freeway dynamic between Luke, Han, and Leia. These three are dramatically different characters, and Lucas does a good job finding chemistry and conflict between them. You have a plucky and optimistic young man who has a lot to learn, a dry-tongued mercenary who cares more about bounties than humanity, and a fierce royal leader with a no-nonsense attitude. All three clash or bounce off each other very naturally, from Han's pessimism challenging Luke's bright-eyed eagerness, 
You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field controls my destiny. To Han's stubborn macho attitude, crossing paths with a fiery princess who can hold her own. I don't know who you are or where you came from, but from now on, you do as I tell you, okay? Look, your worshipfulness, let's get one thing straight. I take orders from just one person, me. You put these three in any situations or space, and their opposite natures inspire engaging interactions. This is a sign of good character writing to me. Of course, one thing that makes this film so iconic is how well it introduces Darth Vader as a threat. As soon as he makes his big, bold entrance, we have a very vivid idea of the kind of villain he is. Imposing, cold, and commanding. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? We intercepted no transmissions! Uh, uh, this is a consular ship! Now, yes, in this stage of the franchise, we just see him as your traditional antagonist who wants to rule the galaxy. But he's still special to the first chapter of this trilogy, because he shows that the ways of the Force and lightsaber skills aren't unique to Jedis, and that these skills have been mastered by someone bent on conquering the galaxy. Yes, the Force and lightsabers are things for our heroes to wield against the dark side, but they don't give them a special advantage over Vader, just a chance to be on the same playing field as our villain. This isn't a simple cut and dry princess rescue mission either because all three are navigating through enemy territory, all while having to rely on stormtrooper disguises to blend in. Where are you taking this thing? Prisoner transfer from cell block 1138. I wasn't notified. I'll have to clear it. One of the most memorable obstacles that our heroes face is the garbage chute. Watching the three of them frantically panic as the walls close in, and noticing a creature swimming in the trash water is damn enthralling. The scene is made even scarier by how Luke can't reach the droids for help. 3PO! Come in, 3PO! 3PO! Where could he be? There's also the iconic duel between Obi-Wan and Vader. Yes, this is a slow lightsaber fight compared to later duels, but it works in the scene's favor. Obi-Wan has been a hermit for years, so of course his swordplay will be rusty, while Vader is seeing his mentor for the first time in ages, and that means he's going to be a bit conflicted about his moves. Someone recently tried to remake this scene with faster and more exciting choreography, while I did think that this was a very impressive fan film, it ends up losing the nuances of the original. Obi-Wan chooses to sacrifice himself, which might confuse folks, but he did say this line. You can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. As a ghost, Obi-Wan can become a more helpful mentor to Luke because he doesn't have to worry about the threat of death anymore, and can focus on inspiring a more youthful hero to carry on his Jedi legacy. Use the Force, Luke. Let go. Let's also pay some credit to the special effects for this movie. Yeah, technology has changed since and we could do better now. But come on, for the 70s, the effects for this movie are amazing for their time. You have to remember that George used his effects department to experiment with cinema firsts, techniques that would later become industry norms. George had a vision that only he had the ambition to tell, so he had to invent special effects that no one else was doing. I especially love the miniature model effects, they still hold up today in an age of fancy CGI. Plus, there's a charm to the fact that these majestic and menacing ships are just toy-sized props. Before I wrap things up, I can't leave without complimenting the film's timeless, jaw-dropping music score by John Williams. Williams' score is one of the most versatile and iconic music soundtracks of all time. Not only is the film chock-full of memorable themes that everyone recognizes on the first note, but there's also loads of compositions that make these scenes so powerful. You easily forget the movie's low budget when John Williams' score sounds so triumphant, emotional, and grandiose. 
At a time when disco and funk conquered the music cinema climate, it was a brave move for George to keep orchestral music alive for his big blockbuster and prove that brass composition still had a place in Hollywood. To conclude, while A New Hope is just the first chapter in a trilogy, it's still a great introduction to the Star Wars universe and the Luke Skywalker saga. Personally, I find a humble charm to it. No one had high hopes for it, and even George himself didn't expect it to be a success. So what we end up with is a film that doesn't overindulge itself. It had no popularity to gloat over or dedicated fans to please, and its earnestness pays off. So those are my thoughts on Star Wars A New Hope. What do you think of this movie? Let everyone know in the comment section below, and don't forget to click that like button. So what am I going to be reviewing in the next episode of Jamboree Orange? Well, as always, that's up to my patrons. The choices for the next episode's poll include The Bad Guys, Morbius, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, Bob's Burgers the Movie, Lightyear, and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Now, don't forget that you have to be a patron in order to access this poll. What is a patron? Don't worry, I'll explain. This is my Patreon. It's a site for my fans to support me financially on through a monthly basis. Those who donate are called Patrons. Patrons can donate as much as they want and are welcome to stop donating any time. In return for their generosity, Patrons are given exciting rewards based on their pledge amount. These rewards include early access to my videos before they go up publicly on YouTube, behind the scenes content, their name in the end credits of my videos, a chance to request a review of anything at all, and much more. Very excited to find out what my patrons pick next. Cheerio, folks.